Uh, I'm David Brothers, and I'm here with LaShawn Thomas. Uh, let's start. I just kind of want to talk to you about just the kind of the path you've taken and how you came up through comics or animation to where you are now. Uh, so just starting at like the very beginning, kind of what brought you to comics and art? Well, um, you know, I, I was born and raised, you know, in, in the South Bronx in, in New York City. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm one of five in my immediate family. Um, uh, total, I have uh, uh, four sisters and three brothers. So I come from a big family. Oh, wow. And um, yeah, and um, but my immediate family is five of us, and uh, you know, having two brothers and two sisters, you know, you uh, it's, it's 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 really hard to stand out. You know what I mean? So, you know, um, being a single mom, well, my mom and my grandmother raised me. After my mother, after my mother and my father got divorced when I was a kid, um, when I, I think I was around ten when they got divorced, um, uh. You know, I just started to, you know, I didn't have that watchful eye on, eye on me anymore, you know. So um, I just started getting into all kinds of stuff. And, you know, my older brother was uh, really into art. And I just kind of copied him just to get attention. I mean, he was kind of the, the major factor. And, you know, as kids, you know, you know, they always say uh, all kids are creative, you know. Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, we're all drawn, you know, at a very young age. And um, somewhere along the line between your preteens and adolescence that kind of gets beat out of you and and the the, the crazy hardcore artists who, who who are fighting for their their childhood are the ones who wind up becoming people like me <laughs> you know what i'm saying so um you know that's kind of how i got into it you know as a family thing and my brother would, would draw and get attention and i kind of just would copy him and then i just you know like they say i just you know you just stuck stick with it and uh yeah, I just stayed with it, and uh, I think I was reinforced to continue doing it by my, my circle and my friends. Um, I had a lot of um, creative um, friends growing up, you know what I'm saying, in the South Bronx, especially mm-hmm. in elementary school, you know, junior high school. I had a, a lot of my friends were, uh, you know, Puerto Rican and Dominican. I grew up in a very diverse neighborhood, you know, John Adam Projects, you know what I'm saying, 152nd, sorry, between Tanton and Union. So... You know, I was, you know, Wales Avenue, you know, um, Prospect Avenue, you know, that's, that's a heavy, heavy Latino community, you know, Latinos, mm-hmm. um, you know, Puerto Ricans and Dominicans, Ecuadorians. So a lot of my classmates were, you know, of the, you know, Puerto Rican, you know, Dominican. So all of my best friends that would draw with me were, you know, like that. So, you know, in elementary school, you know, I had a lot of friends who would get in trouble with me. You know, we would share a little comic books you know we would draw like little squares and then draw like fight scenes in them and share them and then finish them off and stuff like that so growing up you know i i, I was around a lot of creative people on um, whether is whether i try to remember i try to remember that you know um a mm-hmm. lot of times people just say oh you know i've been drawing since i was a kid and they always omit those key people in their lives growing up you know what i'm saying played a role in, in their upbringing and I just I just grew up around a lot of cats, a lot of kids who were like as much into drawing as I was. So I was able to maintain that as I got older. Um, obviously, you know, a lot of my friends were, you know, getting into other things um, in, in, in that in that matter. And, I you know, I just kind of stuck with it. And uh, I think I went to my first comic book convention in New York City. It was, um, damn, what was that convention? It was, uh, I think it was right around... Uh, uh, Penn, Penn Plaza is a hotel on 34th Street, right across the street from Madison Square Garden. They used to hold these comic book conventions in the hotel lobby. And uh, when I got older, I was able to uh, just uh, go to those. And that's how I met a lot of other artists in the second phase of my of my growing up. You know, I met a lot of uh, guys who were like, you know, uh, 14, 15 year olds who, you know, were trying to be comic book artists. So, you know, I, um, you know, I kind of fell into that. And uh, fell into that circle and started building my friends outside of my circle from around the way. So I spent less time around the way and more time around these guys who lived, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. uh, you know, in Manhattan, you know, because right around high school, you know, that's when I started taking the subway, you know. So I think that's I think that around that time I started taking the subway and going to my high school, Julia Richmond High School, which was on. Um, I don't know what school it is now, but when I was growing up, it was a uh, was an arts creative school. And um, it was called Julia Richmond High School. It was on 67th between 2nd and 3rd Ave. And, you know, I would have to take the train to 68th Street on a college station on 68th Street and go there. So right around that time, I got exposed to Forbidden Planet comic book store. They used to have a branch on 59th Street. 
And me and a couple of friends, you know, in the ninth grade, we just walk over there, you know what I'm saying, and just hang out at the comic store all day. So that was kind of how I kind of segue into wanting to be a comic book artist. So, I mean, we're talking about my, you know, how I got into art and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, it was, it, was, uh, it was really, really interesting, you know, during that time. You know, um, Image was really big. You know, they had just separated from Marvel, you know, the whole Oh, yeah, run. that was a wild time. So, yeah, it popped off around that time. So I was convinced that I wanted to be a comic book artist, even though, you know, in the fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, I was doing nothing but drawing Jackson 5, Clarkson, <laughs> trying characters. You know what I'm saying? But, yeah. Like, um, comics, obviously, was the cheapest and accessible way to, you know, um, take your creative, you know, abilities, your illustration abilities and make that into a career, you know, much, much easier than animation at the time. We didn't, I didn't have access to information about how that stuff was put together. I, I viewed animation as like a high level art form. It was something that was on television. Okay. You know what I'm saying? And like, like unfathomable almost. Like, what was that? Like unfathomable almost. Yeah. It was, just on, it was, on, it was like, if you were on TV, it was a big deal. And cartoons were on television. Comic books were at the, you know, at the grocery store and the bodegas around the corner. So, you know, that's kind of how I viewed animation, even as a kid. It's something that I would never thought, never thought I'd be a, be able to contribute to because it was something that was just sacred. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so comics was my first attempt at trying to make a career out of illustration. Um, and uh, you know, through that time, I met some really key individuals in my life who like taught me some life lessons. You know, um, about art, about the 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 the. the the, the science of, of, of illustration, you know, mm-hmm. uh, form, volume, structure, you know, environmental design techniques, you know, practical lighting, all of these basic things that now I take for granted. But as a kid, like, I was just fortunate um, to, to meet certain illustrators who are actually college students, you know what I'm saying, who recognize my work and would give me pointers and that kind of stuff. So I did a lot of that for about a good, I want to say maybe five or six years, you know what I'm saying, especially high school. So... Um, you know, I didn't. I didn't go to college for illustration. You know, so um, for me, I was just a sponge. You know, like anybody I met who knew, like you know, I was always that kid that was like, "Yo, oh, where you draw? Yo, let me introduce you to my my boy Shawnee." You know, that was my name. name is, <laughs> yo, Shawnee can draw. Yo, show him your drawings. Yo, you know that kind of thing. So yeah. I was always in those scenarios in the hood. You know what I mean? Like the dude who's trying to start his own record label. You know what I'm saying? Like I was a guy who was supposed to draw his. You know, his record label logo or T-shirts, you know what I'm saying? That yeah, doing all the design and stuff. Yeah, exactly, you know. So for me, I was just trying to get it where I, where I could, you know. Um, and uh, I think right after I was done with high school, you know, I couldn't figure out what I wanted to do with my time as far as college was concerned. So after I graduated high school, I was working at a, a sporting goods store, <clears throat> excuse me, called Modell Sporting Goods. And... Uh, the manager of that store, I worked in the, I worked in the sporting goods department. The manager of that store uh, noticed, you know, that I was an artist because, um, you know, during inventory in the back, they'd have like these sale tag signs for like, new, you know, deals on sneakers or whatever, golf, you know, clubs or whatever. Mm-hmm. And on the back was blank. So on my spare time when no one was in, when there were no customers, I would just take a bunch of those old sales tags and just draw little sketches on the back of them. And... Um, and I think I was around, I want to say maybe 19. Okay. Um, and I think uh, my boss had saw these drawings and was just like, took them from me. It was like, no drawing on the sales tag. We recycle these, this, that, and the third. And then he came back to me like, maybe like the end of the day and was like, yo, these are cool. Like, you know, <laughs> you got any more of these? You like know? he had a total I, I change just, of heart. What was that? He had a total change of heart. Yeah, yeah. You know, he, I had a stack of these joints because I hit him because I didn't want him to think that I had drawn <laughs> all of these drawings and all of these sales tags, you know? So, um, I showed him the rest of them and, and then he was just like, yo, you know, my wife is a, um, an art director at a, um, at a children's accessories design company that handles licensing for big companies like Disney, Nickelodeon, Warner Brothers or whatever. And, you know, you know, all you do, every time I see you you're drawing, you know, maybe, you know, you'd be interested. Do you have a portfolio? I can introduce you to, you know, my wife's uh, company and maybe she can hook you up with like an internship or something like that. Like he went out like that. So um, I was like, all right, cool. And I had never put a portfolio together. So I uh, I put a portfolio together and uh, and it was just all comic book illustration stuff, you know? Yeah. And the first time I went, I sat down and I was real nervous because I was the only black kid there. You know what I'm saying? It was like mm. everybody was like, no one had experience 
being an illustrator, everyone worked ironically in Photoshop and Adobe Illustrator because they designed like, you know, mini tote backpacks and, you know, duffel bags for kids and stuff. And they put like Mickey Mouse on the cover and, and on the backs and stuff like that. So I, uh, I got turned down for the opportunity. And then I think maybe three months down the line, my boss at the clothing store, at the Model Sporting Goods store, contacted me again. Was like, "Yo, you know, they're opening up a, uh, they're, they're opening a new boys' department um, for sports. You know, have you, uh, do you still have my wife's number? Have you contacted them?" And I, unfortunately, I was kind of embarrassed. Like when they turned me down, I just kind of like. So he called me. He was like, "Yo, no, nah, I'll get him on the phone. I'll set up another meeting for you." And this time, they hired me as an intern, and I worked. I was an unpaid intern. I worked on Mondays and Wednesdays, and. I didn't really do much. I just like got the coffee. I ordered people's lunch and breakfast, you know, I organized samples in the back, photocopies for everybody and stuff like that. But I was just so happy, yo, know, that I had a job at like an actual office. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? Like, <laughs> it was a big deal for me, you know, because I was living in the Jex at the time. So for me getting up, you know, leaving the South Bronx and going all the way to 30, 37th Street, you know what I'm saying? And being in this nice, like, you know, loft studio with all of these computers, I couldn't do anything, but it was just a. <laughs> It's a cool place to be. So um, fast forward to, I want to say, because this is why I'm explaining the story to you. This this is like the catalyst of how I became like, how I decided I was going to be like a legit artist. Like I'm going to pursue this career. Okay. And um, I think, uh, how did the story go? Okay. So are you familiar with the movie Hercules by Disney? Yeah. The animated musical that came out, I want to say maybe 15 years ago, probably, maybe maybe older than that. It came out in the 90s. Yeah. Um, they had gotten the licensing rights uh, by Disney to pitch a, uh, a mini uh, travel tote bag set for girls. And at the time, Hercules was still under development. So every once a year, once a year uh, Disney gets all of these licensing companies together um, that they have dealings with. And they show them their new animated movie or whatever the case may be, just to present to them their new show for marketing and merchandise. Wow. And uh, it turns out that they didn't have anything developed for Hercules at the time. So all they had was like these early concept drawings of Hercules' character and his love interest. And those weren't even the finals. But that's all that my, my art director came back from Cali with. And they were like, look, we, this is all we have. We need to come up with a, a, a travel kit line uh, based off of these characters. So I was the only one who could actually draw. They needed more material than what they had. So they asked me, like, hey, you know, LaShawn, you know, do you think you could do a couple of cartoon sketches, you know, based off of the Hercules myth, you know, and, 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 and see if we can use some of this artwork to come up with a, a, a line of, 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 of duffel bags and travel bags and mini totes and backpacks and stuff like that. And I was like, all right, cool. So I went to the New York Library and, and like, um, took a couple of books out on the Hercules storyline and just did like, I want to say like maybe 40 drawings, Joe, of like just everything, like the seven tasks, you know, the, like the overnight flops, like, huh? Oh, you did them overnight. Yeah. No, no, I did them inside. I did them in like, I want to say inside of like three days. Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, I was the intern B, you know, <laughs> it was like, yo, this, you know, moment of truth. Like, you know, this is the first time you've been working there as an intern for four months. This is the first time they're like coming to you to ask you for something. So I was just kind of like, I. Right, let me see what I can do. And I did like, I was still like more of an, like trying to be like Jim Lee at the time. Okay. So my style was way more like environmental design heavy. You know, I was doing a lot of cross hatching and shadows and, and, and shading and stuff like that in my work. And this was a Disney thing. So I like had to like simplify my drawing style and make it look like more of a Disney cartoon. So I did like 30 drawings and then I like colored them up with like Copic markers and stuff like that. Yeah. I went, I went ham on this. <laughs> like this is my last job kind of thing, you know? And, I handed it in on Monday and then Tuesday I'm off, you know, because I'm only there Mondays and Wednesdays. And the president comes, the vice president comes in and they have an art meeting, an art direction meeting. And, you know, uh, and I'm sorry, by the way, the, um, the, the, the wife of my uh, Model Sporting Goods uh, 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 manager, uh, her name was um, Amy. So they sat down, Amy sat down with, uh, um, I forgot the name of the president of the company. Anyway, they showed him this story, they showed him all my artwork. And he was kind of bugging, like, yo, who drew these? Because he knows no one can actually draw. <laughs> and they were like, oh, yeah, it's this kid named LaShawn. And he didn't even know that they hired me. 
he was like, oh, we have this intern helping us out on Mondays and Wednesdays, you know, he's, you know, his name is LaShawn, and, you know, we asked him to do a couple of drawings, and, you know, he kind of did these for us, so we, you know, we just thought we'd know what you want to, you know, we want to know what you think, and, you know, he was just, this is this is a story being told to me, they were like, he was like, hmm, he was like, oh, I want to meet this kid, you know, so that following, the, the next day, Wednesday, I come into the office, do my normal routine in the morning. I order everyone's lunch, breakfast. You know, I get them their, you know, their food or whatever. And then I'm in the back organizing sample bags and stuff like that. His name is Jeffrey. The president of the company name was Jeffrey. He's on the opposite sample wall and he's looking for something. And I'm on the other wall and he kind of just yells across the room. He goes, hey, LaShawn. And I'm like, uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm the boss, you know, so I'm shook. The Jewish guy, beard, glasses, you know, suit, you know. Yeah. yeah. And, uh. And he's like, he didn't even look at me. His back was still facing towards me while he's looking for something. But he was yelling at me like, "So, uh, what do you think about? Uh, what do you think about? What do you think about coming to work for us?" And I was like, uh, "Yeah, that'd be cool. I could do that, you know." <laughs> and uh, he was like, "All right, cool. You're hired." And I'm like, uh, "Okay." And he was like, "All right, now get back to the samples." I'm like, "All right, cool." So I'm like working on the samples, or whatever. And then like during lunch, I call my uh, my manager Sean at the Model Sporting Goods store, and I'm like, "Yo, you're not gonna believe this." And I'm like, "He's like, yeah, you got hired." I'm like, "Oh, how'd you know?" <laughs> he was like, "My wife told me last night." You know what I mean? I was like, "Oh, snap!" He's like, "Don't fuck it up." <laughs> but it was that because I was always showing up to the office late, so um, so that's how I got that job. So that was the first job that I had in a legit company. I was like 19. I just turned 20. Um, working at an office with my own drafting table, my own lamp, you know what I'm saying? My own little iMac computer, like, and like just doing designs, you know, it was a big deal for me. You know what I mean? So for me, it was like, you know, I, I still had to do all of that stuff. They just, you know, they're like, you still got to order us coffee. You still got to do the samples, but now you're on payroll. You know what I mean? And, you know, you get your own little cubicle corner and any designs that we need from you, you know, concepts, you know, I would do them and then they would take them and then like retro, you know, like fix them up and then, you know, redraw them in Photoshop and Illustrator. And that's kind of how I got my start, you know, working in, 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 in the studio environment. And um, from that, it was that job that got me introduced to Joel Rogers, who was the animation director of a Flash cartoon called World Girl and was the first web cartoon that got picked up by Major Network for Showtime Online. And that was my first introduction to, like, traditional, traditional animation production. And from that job, I met Bus Potemkin, who was the uh, line producer. I mean, who was the producer of the pilots for Cow and Chicken and Powerpuff Girls. Wow. And he had seen my work. And he was the guy who was, like, because he was a consultant on the, on the World Girl Project. And he was looking at my work. And this was, like, around, I want to say 1999. And he was looking at my stuff when I was making copies. And he was like, hey, LaShawn, so... You know, so what are you going to do after this project was up? Because World Girl was kind of winding down. And I was like, you know, I was thinking about going to school for animation. And he just looked at me like I was crazy. He was like, yo, like, you're, you're already doing it. Like, why would you, <laughs> why would you go to school? Like, there are kids in school right now, like, paying, you know, $120,000 just to do the job you have right now. You're already in. Like, you know, like, why would you do that? He's like, if you're going to go to school, go to school for something else. Don't go to school for animation. You're already in. And that that was actually a major turning point in my career. And it, it really confused me because up until that point, I had been doing all of this work on my own, you know, like working for Disney, working for Nickelodeon, working for MTV, you know, licensing products, you know, consumer products, all of this stuff, even flash cartoons. And I'm gaining all of these credits. And I still felt that I was inadequate because I didn't have a degree doing it. And, it, 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 you know, I had that mindset for a very, very long time. And then I think right around 2000 rolled around and I got my opportunity to work with Urban Box Office. I took a class. I remember I took a class at SVA um, in animation and I like <clears throat> and I took a class for uh, fashion illustration just on the side as, at a Fashion Institute of Technology. And I went to Fashion Institute and I was so advanced as an artist above everyone else that the teacher was like, well, you're not really going to learn anything here. How about you just not show up and then at the end of the semester, I'll give you a passing grade. Wow. And this happened at, at School of Visual Arts. So that was kind of like my first introduction to like, okay, well, there's something wrong here. Like my ideas of how things should be aren't exactly what they are. I guess I should continue doing what I'm doing. And that's how I was able to segue into full-on production of anim animation production. And, you know, I was an assistant animator on Lizzie McGuire. I worked with Kevin Lofton, you know, um, and then just started freelancing for different studios. So that's kind of how I got, you know, to where I am now, just following my path and uh, just taking advice from different people because I didn't go to college. So 
Yeah, that's yeah. interesting. You had no formal training at all. You just kind of uh, learned on the job and from friends. Well, yeah. You know, I mean, people say this, the, the term, you know, people say the, the term uh, self-taught very, very loosely. And, and um, yeah, that's more like, that, that does make sense. But I, I'd like to uh, steal a term from a, 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 a colleague of mine named Dan Norton in animation. He's working in, I think, Riot Games right now, super talented artist. I like to call it self-disciplined. <laughs> you yeah. know what I'm saying? Um, I just stayed the course, you know, like I sponge from everybody and um, I steal from, I stole from so many people growing up, like stealing dudes' wrists, how they draw feet, you know, yeah. like, dance, like everything, you know what I mean? And then once I got exposed to anime and animation, um, that's when my work started to make a really big shift, you know what I mean? And where I was coming. So, I, so everything that I've learned, I'm no different from it. And, and I learned like by the time I was like 24, I realized, well, I'm no different from the kid graduating college. The difference is, is that my teachers weren't in a formal structured institution. It was more of like the industry was my school. You know what I'm saying? And I learned from guys who were actually accomplished with degrees. <laughs> so technically, I'm still school taught. I just, you know what I'm saying? It's I'm just secondhand. Being, yeah. Yeah. I'm just being taught at the office because all the guys I learned from were college graduates. So it's not like, you know what I mean? There's this, you know, romantic view of me struggling walking in the streets by myself trying to learn anatomy and shit like that like you know i learned a lot from people i sponged a lot from people you know so um is that still uh like having that community around you is that still vital right now like now that you're kind of at the top of the heap in a way um i, I wouldn't i wouldn't consider myself a top of the heap that's another discussion yeah <laughs> <laughs> but um i do think that um uh yeah, that's still the it's it's I still think that same way and I think that's how I I think that's how my career has gone for the last 14 years, man. Like that's how I've always thought like, okay, I'm going to get into this place and who's the best guy here? I'm going to get to know that person really well and then I'm just going to build with him and learn as much as I can from that person. You know, that's what I did when I went to Sony. That's what I did when I went when, you know, when I was at Sony, I was always working with Bob Hathcock, who's the supervising director of Boondocks. That's what I did when I went to uh, Cartoon Network working on Alien Force you know I was always in Glenn Murakami's office you know what I mean like mm -hmm. learning from him Butch Lukic was my director um, on Alien Force and he's like alumni Bruce Tim alumni I mean this guy directed on Batman Beyond Batman the Animated Series like I learned from like the best guys you know what I'm saying mm -hmm. and then I reached a point in my career where I started to want to I, I started to get disgruntled about the compartmentalization of animation production you know how Hollywood just became television and television animation in Hollywood back then to me just became this pre-production bubble. You know what I'm saying? Like everyone was it's like we became so detached from the process of animation making, you know what I mean? Because everything's outsourced overseas that pre-production was like the joint. Like if you were a storyboard artist, you were the shit. Uh -huh. You know, your name gets mentioned in the DVD commentary, but the animators don't. And those guys do the dopest work. You know what I mean? Like I had an issue with that. So um, in 2009, like the end of 2008, 2009, I decided to like, you know, um, just try and do something different, you know, and I found an opportunity through a mutual friend to quit my job at Warner Brothers, pack my stuff and, and just move out of the country and move to where they were actually making the cartoons. And I'm not just talking about designing characters storyboarding and then shipping it off and then waiting you know 19 weeks you know uh for animation to come back fully finished and completed and then everyone's sitting complaining about you know stuff being on model but they weren't there during the process of animation like i didn't want to deal with that i wanted to be like in the mix you know what i'm saying so uh -huh. i knew that was the only way i was going to be able to level up the way i wanted to and it's not a knock on any of my peers that i've worked with in the industry i just think that my level of of of, 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 of of my level of passion for learning more stopped at storyboards you know what I'm saying like um, no one was doing layout no one knew who the animators were no one knew who was animating what no one knew who was good at effects animation or acting animation or action animation or mecha animation on these shows that we work on and I wanted to know those things because I wanted to be in that environment. I felt like I was losing that environment that I that I came up in, you know what I mean? Being around people and learning from people. And I just felt like I wasn't learning anything anymore um, about animation production outside of the political aspect of it, outside of, you know, 
uh, the office politics aspect on the American side. I wanted to actually learn what it was like to be in the artist politics, you know, to work with animators and in-betweeners and compositors and that kind of stuff. So, you know what I'm saying? Me, me decided to pick up and move to Korea was what you mentioned, like that, that environment, me trying to maintain that environment of learning from people and stuff like that. And I did. So, yeah. And it's interesting. You, uh, I feel like you passed on that knowledge that you got through soul sessions. I try, I try because I, you know, it was soul sessions was therapeutic for me. You know, like I, I touched on it. On, I did a Ted talks a couple of years ago, um, uh, talking about my time there in Korea and it was a TEDx talks. And uh, in Seoul, I did it. And uh, I just felt like, you know, during that time when I was out there, it was the first six months was really harsh for me. You know, I put up a good friend online, you know, I'm having a good time. And I was, but when times were tough, they were, you know, and, you know, leaving your family, leaving your country, being a completely foreign place, you know, and you're there as an artist, which is really, really different because Mm -hmm. they have certain expectations of Americans and 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 things that they take for granted about us that we don't know about you know what i mean and vice versa so it was a real challenge for me to be the spokesperson for artists in america being the only guy there i didn't want them to think oh americans are lazy these guys don't work as hard as we do because those dudes work hard over there so i had to like pull up my you know my bootstraps and 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 and, and really go in and during that time it got really really tough for me so I started recording what I was doing, thanks to my boy Vince, who's actually the producer and the editor of the Soul Sessions thing. We were friends, and we would correspond, and he was like, yo, you need to record some of this stuff. And I started doing that, and it was therapeutic for me. Because if I don't, I think if I didn't do that, I would probably have gone crazy down there. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Like, <laughs> like trying to like create a moment for it. And, and I wanted to, uh, I don't know, I, I just wanted to come back with something to show for it. You know what I mean? And to prove like, yo, this is, this is what's going on over there. You know what I mean? And and I felt like this is relevant to what we're doing because of globalization, because of, you know, the big, you know, uh, uh, issue behind outsourcing and, and what's been happening in the recent uh, feature film industry of VFX animation and stuff like that. And I just felt like I knew it wasn't going to be this big, big deal, but I knew that I had a strong enough following that if I put it out there, people would pay attention. You know what I'm saying? And so yeah. that's the reason why I did it, you know. And I wanted to inspire a lot of up and coming kids especially kids of color to see that there's a, cause to me, like growing up, you know, if I was 14, you know what I'm saying? Like back in the, <laughs> you know, back in the late eighties, early nineties, being 14 and seeing this black dude in South Korea or Japan, just going to animation studios and making cartoons, I would lose my mind, dog. Yeah. Like, be bugged out. Like <laughs> I would just straight up lose my mind. Like, yo, that nigga look just like me. <laughs> it's like, yo, he looks just like me. Like, yo, I could do this now. You know what I mean? This isn't a foreign thing. I didn't know we did this kind of stuff. And that's part of the reason why I did it. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. whoever, it, whoever it reached, however big or small a scale, that's all that matters to me. It, that was part of the reason why I did it, you know, was to, you know, it, just show, have and show for my time out there. You know what I'm saying? And to kind of inspire young artists like, yo, you know, this this is what's happening this is we can do this stuff you can do this stuff too you know and uh and just and just put a positive spin on it you know because for so long you know uh, a lot of uh, you know, the process of animation making is, is still kind of a mysterious thing you know mm-hmm. and so many people are unaware that south koreans animate all of our best shows you know so um i wanted to kind of you know shed some light on that you know so there was several there were several bits of ground that I covered with Soul Session that I wanted to cover. One was to, you know, uh, uh, stay excited about my time out there, to introduce something unique um, from a different, a unique perspective in animation, um, to kind of inspire aspiring artists, you know, to aspiring artists to come up and want to step up and, and, and be more involved in the process of animation, um, to motivate a lot, a lot of young, you know, uh, people of color, kids of color, artists of color, you know what I'm saying, seeing people that look like them you know, doing these great things. And then it also doubled as an artist profile. Cause you know, I hadn't put out an art book in a long time and all of the work that I've been working on the TV animation, you know, it's very hard to put that stuff out in the open because, you know, it's, it's, um, it's illegal to put that stuff out there when you sign a non-disclosure agreement. So a lot of the stuff that animators work on, they can't share, you know what I mean? Until the show mm-hmm. airs. So for me, it was just like, all right, well, let me, let me put something out there you know, for people to see. And I can't show any of the stuff that I was working on, which was like Legend of Korra, you know, um, 
uh, the Black Dynamite stuff, but I had my own projects that I was developing, so I used my own project as kind of the guinea pig for the show. You know what I mean? So it made it easier for me to pull it off. Yeah, it's one thing I'm taking away from uh, what you're saying is that understanding the bigger picture. Like if you're focused on one thing, like if you're good at storyboards, it helps to know the rest of production. Exactly. Or if you know, you know, if you're deep in production, it helps to know like who's actually you know drawing each frame. Uh, that right. greater context, like how is that? How does that help you? Like, what does that? What options does that give you? Well, for me, um, uh, you know, I'm again, uh, you know, I'm I'm the I want to I want to direct, I want to produce. You know, that's always been my goal. I want to be a person who's who, who who's able to tell his own stories, and 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 to reach a wide audience. And that's still one of my biggest dreams. You know, to be able to do an animated feature or you know finally get my own television show. You know what I mean, where I can just really say the things I want to say and and do the stuff that I want to do. You know, that's still mm-hmm. my dream. That hasn't been tainted yet because I haven't done it yet. You know, <laughs> so. Um, and I just feel like for me, uh, and part, you know, part of the reason why I left to go to Korea was because I became frustrated with the, the pink elephant in the room, which is outsourcing the, 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 the accepted ignorance of how an animated show is actually produced. You know, you have producers and directors in TV, and it's through no fault of their own. I'm sure they would love to go overseas, too, but, you know, budgets are shrunken now, so there's not a lot of money to spend on people to spend, you know, six, seven months over there. But for me, I like to know who's animating my show. You know, who's the best animator? Who's my animation chief? What has he animated before? I don't want them to hire, for example, if you have a show, say David Brothers has his own show. You have Mm -hmm. your own show. You're producing the animation. You're going to go overseas. Let's just say you have an overseas studio. Produce it. You want to know who's your chief animator, don't you? Like, wouldn't you want to know if this guy worked on Bob's Burgers or Ghost in the Shell? Wouldn't you want to know that? Yeah, you know what definitely. I mean? like, wouldn't that affect your production, you know, um, knowing who's good at what, you know? Um, regular animation studios do it. Feature animation studios do it. They don't just hire random people without knowing what their credentials are. They make sure that they're exactly who that person needs to be for the type of show they're trying to make or movie they're trying to make. And the same thing should apply to TV animation, but for some reason that's kind of got lost in the shuffle because the bottom line is more important than art direction. So you see a lot of animated shows that come back and they just kind of look all the same, more or less. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And the shows that don't kind of look the same are the shows that are produced by people who are actually trying to do something different. You know what I mean? And when you find out, you find out how incredibly difficult it was to do those kind of shows, you know? Um, And for me, if I'm going to produce a show, I want to know everything. I have to know everything. You know, I want to know who's the best storyboard artist, who's good at, and and I'm talking about nuanced things. Like you have a guy who has experience working on, um, you know, let's just say only WB cartoons. You know, this guy's, you know, uh, storyboarded on Warner Brothers cartoons all the time. But I want to do something like Samurai Champloo or Boondocks. Mm-hmm. And Warner Brothers cartoons are primarily uh, boys' cartoons ages 6 to 11. So there are staging techniques and styles that are only unique to Warner Brothers cartoons. If you watch a Warner Brothers cartoon, a lot of those cartoons are staged the same. Lots of two shots, three shots, groups. It's all, it's all kind of like TV-safe staging for kids to absorb. And I want to do something that's like, you know, Ergo Proxy or, or Champloo or, you know what I'm saying, or something that that's a little bit more cinematic Mm -hmm. and there are people who are very good at that and there are people who are not very good at that and if you're mindful about the people you're hiring you have more control over your resources and how to get exactly what you want instead of just leaving it up to you know uh instead of leaving it up to them to decide you know yeah so um it's 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 fascinating because i'm talking about a process that is compartmentalized we're talking about drastic measures to do what normal animation studios do <laughs> you know what i mean um in an outsourcing system you know and that's really that's really the biggest challenge in television animation for daytime it's that most of it is outsourced and i don't have a problem with the outsourcing aspect of it what i have a problem with is it being outsourced and we don't have access or or full information on controlling the actual main production process and that's part of the reason why i went to korea because i wanted to see exactly how they pick their talent Who's good at what? How does it work? What are the politics? You know, and so on and so forth. And that's kind of, and that's that's part of the reason why I went out there. So you wanted a collaboration instead of a handoff. And that's for sure. And that's exactly it. You know, for me, you know, my my opinions aren't very popular. You know, my my, my opinion is, you know, we're, we're living in a globalized world now. The world's shrinking. You know this. Yeah. There's no such thing as a nationalist point of view to animation production anymore. That's foolish to me. It's not about 
oh, this is American animation, you know, or it's not about, uh, 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 it's not about us versus them. It's about where in the world can I find someone to direct my TV show? <laughs> and that's not a question to ask now in this day and age. You know what I mean? So for me, if I can't find a guy who can direct a show like Black Dynamite or Boondocks, the chances of me finding them in France, Korea, or Japan is much higher. So I'm going to go over there. It's not because I want to save money. It's because I want to collaborate with that talent. You know what I'm saying? That makes so, sense. So for me, when people, when I, when I, I've spent so much time in Korea and I've lived over there, you know, I'm a, I'm a little bit more biased to, I'm a little bit more sympathetic to the talent over there, you know? So for me, it's like, I've talked to a couple of people, you know, in the last year or so, and I tell them, you know, oh, I'm working on Black Dynamite season two, or whatever, what have you. And they're like, oh, who's producing it? I'm like, oh, I'm working with the studio Moi in Korea. And they're kind of like, oh, you're outsourcing it? Man, everything's getting outsourced and we're losing our jobs, that whole spiel. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 You're making it sound like we're hiring a bunch of 12 year olds, mm -hmm. you know, to make shoelaces for 10 cents a week. That's, that's not what we're doing here. You know what I'm saying? Like, if I work in France, if I work in London, if I work in Japan, it's considered a collaboration. But if I work in Korea, it's outsourcing. Why is that? You know what I'm saying? Like, it's a dirty word almost. Hmm. And for me, my thinking is like, it's not about that. It's about globalization. It's about technology. It's about everyone being connected to each other. And if I, if I need a guy, if, if, if I'm surrounded by a bunch of people who only know how to draw, and this is not a knock to those shows. I love those shows. It's about style and choices and fits. If I'm surrounded by a bunch of people who only know how to work on shows like Adventure Time, you know, uh, 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 Warner Brothers cartoons, you know, or, 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 you know, Bob's Burgers or anything. Those shows are brilliant. But if I want a show that looks like Space Dandy or Samurai Champloo, I can't go to those guys. I'm right. going to go where the talent is. And it just happens to be abroad. And it just happens to be a convenience that, you know, the Korean won is cheaper than a dollar. But that's not why I'm going over there. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how things are shifting now in my world as far as production is concerned. The type of shows I want to make, the type of talent I want to work with, it is very hard to find that talent in America because animation university professors are not ed educated in that type of production. They're not skilled in that type of drawing style and they're not pumping out kids to produce that stuff. So I have to go where they're making that stuff. And a lot of times it's in France, it's in Korea, it's in Japan. And that's just where I am right now. You know? And it's funny you said you wanted to be, uh, you know, create your own, sh create your show, be a producer. But I feel like most people don't know what producers do for animation. Um. Well, what do you think a producer does in animation? If I had to guess, he, yeah, he's the guy who hires the guys who know how to put the show together. Okay, that's true. There's when I say producer, I'm talking about a creative producer. Mm -hmm. Um, it doesn't hurt to be a producer and have experience actually working on television shows. It makes you better because most producers in television, it's because television is scripted. Most producers are just writers. Mm -hmm. um, they don't know anything about making cartoons. Some of them do. But in my experience, the writers that I've worked with have very little experience about production, animation production. But they have the producer title. You have there's different types of producers. You have creative producers. You just have regular producers, then you have line producers. A line producer is actually a job function. That's kind of what you mentioned. A line producer is the person who deals with people, time, and money. They manage the budgets. They're in charge of hiring the talent with the advice and influence of the creative producers, of course, and the executive producers, but they're in charge of hiring the talent, managing the budget, uh, making the schedule, you know, and making sure things are being delivered on time. That's an actual job function. Like, if that guy quits, the production is doomed. Mm -hmm. Producer quits, not so much. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Create a producer, yeah, we're doomed because that person is actually making the show, you know. So you, so it's it's the the producer title thing is very very vague and and it's a very it's, it, it depends on the show production that you're working on, you know. Yeah, I wonder if that's a holdover just from uh, like live action production. Could if it's be. just a shared term and it just hasn't quite grown into its own own uh, definition yet. That's a very good. That's a very good observation. You, you, you're probably right. Um, Can you talk uh, about uh, successful failures a little bit? And oh, the the uh, the TEDx bit. Yeah. Yeah. What do you want to know? Uh, just basic, broad idea of like what you get from a successful failure. Um, I think it's. It's it's pretty much what it sounds like, you know. I mean, for me, like, then the only way I can describe what it means is, you know, 
you, you can't really reach who you want to be without failing. You have to make mistakes. Otherwise, you're not going to know what to do right or what to do wrong. Mm-hmm. You know, and I've learned that, you know, growing up as a kid, you know, we're taught we're not, ta- you know, and this goes back to our, what I was explaining earlier. Growing up as a kid, as growing up as kids, we're kind of taught how to. We're really, really creative when we grow up. When we're kids, we're really, really creative. We're really honest. But as we get older, we're, we're constantly being beat into not being creative. We're, we're told that um, taking risk is bad. You know, uh, being creative is not a very good thing. Um, and failing is really, really bad, mm-hmm. you know. So, you know, for me, how would I word it? Okay, for example, as children, right, mm-hmm. if, you're, if, if you're asked a question, chances are you're going to take a risk in getting it right if you don't know it. If you don't know the answer, you're going to probably lie. It's not a lie. You're just going to take a shot at guessing. Yeah. <laughs> you know I mean? um, as you grow older... Not having the right answer is a very bad thing. You know what I mean? But it's the creative aspect of guessing is that we're losing. And I feel like, you know, people are so afraid of taking that risk. They're so afraid of failing that they're frozen. They don't, they don't do anything. And I feel for me, the only way you're going to be able to get to where you want to go is if you just take a risk. And, yeah, you'll fail, but you'll know what to do, you know, you'll know what to do right next time. And I think the biggest challenge for people is overcoming that first step, you know. Um, and to me, like all of the people that I look up to, all of the people that are considered icons, they've all failed. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Steve Jobs, didn't he lose his job at some point? You know, yeah. <laughs> he went bankrupt. You know what I mean? Walt Disney went bankrupt. You know, Snow White ruined him. You know what I mean? Like all of these guys that are like legends in the game, you know, uh, failed miserably and screwed up, but they didn't give up. You know, mm-hmm. they used that. They used those lessons. You know, to, to, to say, okay, this time I'm going to do it right next time, and so on and so forth, and they keep pushing. It's the same thing at Hollywood. The people who stick around the longest are the people who don't give up, you know? Mm-hmm. So for me, you know, without sounding super romantic or whatever, I just feel like <laughs> like a lot of it is just perseverance and persistence, you know, and lessons, you know? Um, so that's part of the reason why, you know, I got invited to speak on that venue. You know, the whole venue was called Successful Failures in Korea. And it was, I think it was myself and I think 11 other speakers uh, from different walks of life talking about their, you know, their, their, their journey, their, you know, how they got to where they are. Um, so, yeah, for me, when, when I think of successful failures, I think about people who failed a lot to get to where they are. You know, you remember the Michael Jordan commercial, you know? Yeah. It's 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 the same logic. It's the same theory. You know, it's about overcoming fear of taking risks. You know, so some risks are wor- are not worth taking. <laughs> you know what I mean? But for the most part, you know, it really is just about not giving up. So awesome. Uh, so can you, what can you tell us about what you have coming up this year? What do you want to plug? Um. Well, obviously, we got Black Dynamite coming up. Uh, yeah, season two is we're working really, really hard on that, and um, it's coming along really well. We're, we're gonna, I, I think we're gonna, we're gonna try and change the game with this one. <laughs> really <laughs> just take it to another level. Um, without speaking too much on it, you know, because uh, I'll leave that up to Carl Jones. But yeah, um, definitely. Um, but yeah, it's it's gonna be really, really. We're just taking everything to the next level this time around. So um, you yeah, look out for that. I, I can't really speak on the actual release date of that but it is definitely happening this year so um you know we're just trying to uh you know trying to leave a legacy man just trying to leave you know trying to hopefully influence a lot of young artists to come up you know after seeing shows like this and the boondocks and stuff to try and you know uh take the mantle and and and, and add to what what's being established you know we're trying to create a market with the type of shows we're making you know with boondocks and black dynamite um so, you know, hopefully this year when we drop it and, I, I you know, Boondock Season 4 is dropping this year, too. So it's going to be a really interesting year, you know, for animated content on television. Um, I also have an art book that I'm dropping this year as well called um, The Foreign Exchange. It's my third volume. I put out two volumes a couple of years ago, a few years ago. Mm-hmm. One was a Nervous Breakdown sketchbook. And then I did a, uh, a Midnight Marauder uh, art book in 2008. That sold out and did pretty well, and I've, I've just been super busy since then, obviously, moving out of the country. And now that I'm back and I've kind of gotten all my ducks in order, you know, I'm ready to, to put out another book. So I plan to release that sometime this year. Awesome. Well, thanks for talking with me, man.